Hey guys, my name is Dice Roland. Today we're going to be taking a look at a movie that gave us a rather serious take on werewolves. Written by Jim Harris, Wesley Strick, and Elaine May, Wolf was directed by Mike Nichols and was released on June 17, 1994. The response to this film has been decent since its release, with a number of critics enjoying its story, if not for the more blatant supernatural elements involved. It was even nominated during the Grammy and Saturn Awards in multiple categories, and actually won Best Writing. Will Randall is an aging publisher who just doesn't seem to have much going for him anymore. He's being demoted at work, his marriage is failing, and he doesn't have the energy for life anymore. His rather somber life is drastically changed, however, when a wolf bites him. Will begins to notice improvements in his health, determination, and senses, but he begins to realize that he doesn't recall what he's done the night before. So without further ado, this is my review of Wolf. <laughs> The movie begins with a scenic winter landscape, where Will Randall, played by Jack Nicholson, is making the drive back home through Vermont. But he hits a bit of a bump in the road. Now I know what you're thinking, animal lovers, but don't worry. The wolf was only knocked out for a moment, and promptly bites Will on the hand. Seeing that he has not in fact killed an animal, and that he's outnumbered, Will makes a hasty retreat. Or at least as hasty of a retreat as he can in a Volvo on a snowy road. The next day we get a bit of insight into Will's line of work at the publishing house. We also meet his secretary Mary, played by Eileen Atkins, and co-worker Roy McAllister, played by David Hyde Pierce. Apparently, Will is in danger of being fired. at a Already hosted by his new boss, no less. During this takeover of the publishing company, it's agreed by a number of people working there that they will leave if Will is fired. During this explanation of what's happening, we're also introduced to Will's protege, Stuart Swinton, played by James Spader. That night, at the party hosted by Raymond Alden, played by the late Christopher Plummer, there's a bit of an existential conversation going on. Well, you could make a case that the world has already ended. It's confiding in Oprah an exploration in depth of why women cut off their husband's penis. Way to kill a dull mood, Will. Now I see why you're getting dumped by the company. Speaking of, Mr. Alden summons Will to share a cigar outside after a pretentious dinner. He tells him that he's essentially demoting Will and sending him to Europe. The reason why is that he feels the company needs someone with more drive and conventionalism than Will has. Interestingly, this person taking Will's job is Stuart. On a side note, it seems that the horses have an adverse reaction to Will's presence. Will wanders off to prevent the horses from full-on staying stampeding, and almost seems to have a mini stroke. Thankfully, Laura, played by Michelle Pfeiffer, is there to assist with some old school medicine, otherwise known as whiskey. Will learns a few things during this exchange. Laura is Raymond Alden's daughter, and she's the strong independent type who isn't easily surprised. Upon returning to the party, Will drops news on his wife, Charlotte, played by Kate Nelligan, and the two-timing Stuart. Obviously, for the rest of the night, Will is pretty fucking defeated. He spends the entire next day in bed, even. However, upon waking Waking up, he feels so great that his appetite for more than just food has increased. Upon returning to work, it seems that other things about Will's senses have increased too, like his sense of smell. How the fuck can you drink tequila this early? How the fuck did you know? You kidding? You can smell it a mile away. Other changes include improved eyesight and hearing. This urges Will to seek out some information on, as he puts it, animal possession. This leads him to have a call put into Dr. Vijay Alizaeus. After a long day at work, Will returns home to make a disheartening discovery about his wife. Clearly this is going to make both his professional and home life rather awkward. But if I'm being honest, I think the levels of awkward go up way more for Stuart and Charlotte, given. Never rub another man's rhubarb. On the bright side, this seems to have spurred him on to fight against being demoted. And not just that, either. He puts a plan in place to create his own publishing company, and take as many top-tier authors with him as he can. This is primarily a tactic to scare his new boss, of course. He then confronts Stuart with a level of calm and composed, yet threatening, that I truly admire. He then pays Alden a visit to inform him he won't be taking the job in East Europe. While there, he startles a horse that Laura is riding, which causes her to be thrown off. No major damage done. 
one, but it does raise some concern over the fact that Will's presence seems to have a disconcerting effect on animals. Laura invites Will to have lunch with her in an attempt to evade having lunch with her father and his friends. So Laura and Will end up having an impromptu PB&J meal, while getting to know each other a little better. Despite a rocky start, they do begin to enjoy each other's presence. At some point, Will confides in Laura about his incident with the wolf, and how it seems to be affecting him now. She takes this in with surprising ease, and even invites him to stay for dinner. Before they can return to the guest house Laura's staying in, though, Will has what appears to be some kind of attack, so he'll definitely be staying the night here. or not. Given Will's current wolf-like status, he spends the night doing a little hunting. Personally, I think if all the people who wanted to hunt did it in this fashion, it'd be a lot more interesting. By the time Will wakes up at sunrise, he finds himself in the woods covered in blood. He does have a pretty logical response to this, which is to seek medical help, assuming he was sleepwalking and had bumped his head. You know, nothing bleeds like this scalp. Yeah, as someone who's nearly cracked their skull open once, I agree with him on that. Though this doctor recommends that he get some scans done and stay overnight, Will declines this. Instead, he goes to a meeting with Mr. Alden and his counselor to discuss Will's previously mentioned plan to start his own company. Alden offers him his job back, but Will demands an increase in his pay and power in the company, which Alden agrees to. There is the added bonus of no one being told about this, including Stuart. So Will will have that privilege. There's also that appointment with Dr. Alizaeus to attend to. Will explains the events that led to his current situation situation, and the good doctor is totally unfazed by this. Among my people, there is only one explanation for your symptoms, is uh, that you are becoming a wolf. Yep, that would explain it. While Dr. Alizaeus is speaking from a scientific standpoint, he tells Will what he knows about the mythos of this demon wolf. The wolf is neither good nor evil, it's up to the character of the person, and how it grows inside a person until the following full moon. Of course, Will asks if there is a way to stop the wolf transformation. There's a few ways, but Dr. Alizaeus doesn't have knowledge or possession of two out of three. But he does have a powerful amulet which he gives to Will. He only asks for one thing in exchange, for Will to bite him. He has a valid reason for this request. He is dying, so if Will should bite him, then he will become a wolf too, and his life would be prolonged. However, Will just can't bring himself to do this. I mean, it would be a little weird to, well, fully human, bite a guy's hand. Having essentially moved into a hotel room for the time being, Will's next order of business is to call Laura. He explains why he disappeared that morning, and though she's not at all pleased, with this the fact that he blames a head injury helps. So Laura agrees to meet him at his hotel room the following evening. In the meantime, it's another night of prowling the urban jungle, which means that Will ends up at the zoo warranting the attention of the police. Not that this is a problem for him. Hey! And neither is an attempted jumping of his person. The next morning, it's time for the closing of the deal between Mr. Alden and Will. So now it's time for the fun part. Telling Stuart that his new job has been yanked out from under him. And... You're fired, Stuart. Well, this seems to be quite a good day for Will. Until he finds the snack he saved for later. Another bump in the road is Charlotte greeting him upon his return to the hotel, with a plea to return. Which, of course, he firmly denies. And Laura, who saw the whole thing, meets him in his room, despite the fact that he doesn't want her to be around at the moment. Will has even gone so far as to handcuff himself to prevent himself from wandering around after dark. Laura doesn't find this to be such a flawless plan, and manages to unlock the cuffs. Instead, she handcuffs his hands behind his back, and finds a different method of distraction. It's a good attempt, but Will still ventures out for nightly activities, which in this case involves riling up every canine in the general area. The following day, Will and Laura are visited by Detective Bridger, played by Richard Jenkins, and Detective Wade, played by Brian Markinson. It seems they have some bad news for Will. Charlotte was found dead in the park by means of her throat being torn out. Obviously, Will assumes that he had done this, and just doesn't remember, like every night thus far. In an effort to ensure Will's safety and the safety of the general public. Laura takes him back to the Alden estate. Through some bits of evidence, Laura's starting to think that maybe Will is right, and he's got some Lawrence Talbot shit going on. Just to add to this, she receives a phone call from Detective Bridger. He tells her that he still wants Will and herself to come in for statements, but more important than that... There was canine DNA 
found in all of the tissue samples. So Laura locks Will in one of the horse stalls and heads to the police station. There she meets Stuart, who's also there to give a statement about Will, though I think it's safe to say that it won't be in his defense. Laura picks up on there being something off about Stuart, but plays it off until he's out of sight. While Laura sets up a plane to leave with Will, Will is fighting against his inner wolf. Stuart gives his very incriminating statement before realizing that Laura is no longer in the station. So he follows her back to the Alden estate, knowing that Will will also be there. He confronts and attacks Laura while she attempts to set Will free. Will takes the amulet off and allows his wolf to come to the forefront in order to fight Stuart and protect Laura. And while Will does pretty well in taking Stuart down, the final blow goes to Laura. <laughs> With the threat gone, Will leaves Laura, likely figuring that it would be too dangerous to stay with her. The authorities arrive, and Laura comes up with the lie that Will had left to the airport, and she has no idea of the events that transpired outside. It works, as both Mr. Alden and Detective Bridger buy her story. However, we have a little twist here, as Laura seems to have the wolf now. And with a POV running through the wilderness, the credits roll. One word I would use to describe wolf is elegant. This could have easily been a ridiculous story to try to tell, and I know to some it still is, but everyone involved played it serious with a touch of humor that makes the events feel more grounded in reality. At the same time, it feels almost dreamlike in the quality of how things are presented. Obviously, Wolf was not what a lot of people were expecting it to be, and I'm sure that the trailer for it didn't help at all. If you went into this movie expecting it to be packed full of dramatic action and werewolf scenes, then I can see how it may have let some people down. There is an all-star cast here, and everyone puts 100% into their roles no matter how big or small they are. The three people who get the most screen time, and deservingly so, are Jack Nicholson, Michelle Fox Pfeiffer and James Spader. Jack Nicholson's performance as Will is really captivating to watch. He conveys a man who's essentially given up on his life, as it's falling apart around him, then makes the transformation to someone who is going to fight for himself and what he wants, all the while trying to understand and deal with what is happening to him internally and what that could mean. Michelle Pfeiffer does quite well as an independent and aloof woman who finally finds someone she truly cares for and vice versa, as well as trying to keep things together when all hell is breaking loose. Laura is a pretty good example of what I hope to see in characters that are the love interest of the main character. She's constantly active in the story and trying to help, or do productive things and not just act as a damsel in distress. Even when she technically is in distress, she's putting up a good fight. James Spader is very good at playing a conniving asshole, but at the same time, you're intrigued by his character and want to see what he'll do. He's a likable antagonist that you enjoy seeing plot, as well as be put in his place by Will. I also very much enjoyed David Hyde Pierce and Prunella Scales in this. As I said, all of the actors were on point with their performances throughout. They kept just enough tongue-in-cheek tone to balance the situations they were in, and everyone plays off each other wonderfully especially the main three actors. I can't find a single setting that I didn't like here. They're all beautiful and rich to look at, but don't detract from the characters and what's going on. They serve as wonderful canvases for events to unfold. This isn't just New York that's being shown. It's more upscale New York where the people who have money live. <laughs> I would absolutely live in Laura's cottage, by the way. I adore the atmosphere that was created in this film. It's distinct and ethereal and gorgeous to witness. I really don't think I could come up with the right words to do its description justice, but it really is fantastic. The special effects were practical with Rick Baker on board. I really don't think I need to say anything more. I like the Henry Hole-like approach that was taken with the werewolf looks. I commend how they paid homage to the classic Wolfman, designed while bringing some newer elements to it. Once again, it could have looked very goofy, but it was pulled off well. The subtle prosthetics and hair appliances that were gradually added through the course of the film paid off. Even the deer that Will hunts and kills was a practical effect, and animatronic puppet. During the fight between Will and Stuart, there are a few brief moments where bust puppets were used. They may not be utterly convincing, but they're still impressive. The scoring, composed by the late Ennio Morricone, is gorgeous. I quite enjoyed the main theme the first time I watched this movie, and that's continued since then. The entirety of it melts together seamlessly and elevates the scenes without overpowering them. Specific portions weave an ethereal vibe. I listened to the whole thing on its own just because. It's hauntingly beautiful and at times holds a dangerous edge to it. With all that being said, I'm giving Wolf 9 out of 10 bloody thumbs up. I feel like this is a highly underrated movie that deserves more attention than it's received. It has become one of my favorite werewolf movies.
movies. I was surprised by how the story was told when I first watched it, because just judging from the description, I thought it was going to be unintentionally silly. That's not to say that it isn't a touch, so anyway. This is a movie where I feel that all the different elements come together very well. I was satisfied with how the story was concluded, and the cliffhanger that was given to us. The emotions that were conveyed are fitting, and it all flows seamlessly. It's not one of those happy ending sort of movies, and I'm glad it isn't because that wouldn't have fit with the themes. Oddly enough, the fact that the focus isn't solely on the werewolf portions of the story makes it even better. It's a very important part of the film, but we also have the human aspects to focus on, and that's honestly perfect for a wolfman-like story. I would recommend Wolf to werewolf enthusiasts, people who like their horror with added elements, as well as being more grounded in reality, Nicholson and Pfeiffer fans, and anyone who would like to see what really happens in the publishing industry. So I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did, give it a like to let me know. Don't forget to leave a comment down below telling me what you think of this movie. And if you have any suggestions for horror movies you would like to see me review in the future, you can support the channel through my Patreon where you would get exclusive and early access to videos like this. Also don't forget to share this video to help the channel grow and subscribe for more videos like this. See you later. I've never loved anybody this way. Never looked at a woman and thought, if civilization fails, if the world ends, I'll still understand what God meant. <laughs>